So I wasn't particularly sure where to start. I guess I could start literally at the very beginning. I was born on December 7th, 1987, a relatively cool Monday in La Jolla, California. It was about 4 p.m. when I finally made my appearance. There were police escorts from naval bases, happy tears. It was the 80s, so there was amazing photographs of hairstyles I never knew my family had. <laughs> it takes a village to raise a child. It wasn't until I was much older that I was fully able to understand the true magnitude of what this phrase means to me and who I am right now. I got where I am today not necessarily just because of moments in my life, but due to some truly amazing and selfless people. People that chose to put time and energy into raising a child that wasn't theirs. People that had the sole purpose of giving a child everything that they truly deserved. So my parents divorced when I was four. My dad obviously was military. He spent 21 years in the US Navy. So when my parents divorced, my dad decided to move back to Michigan and make Michigan his home base. It was a lot of summer vacation travels, but it was the reality of the situation. My mom got remarried, and she married a wonderful man named Charlie. There was never a question if I was Charlie's. There was never a question if Charlie was mine. Maybe in the beginning, because I'm a daddy's girl, so there was a lot of I'm not cool with this new arrangement. My little sister happened, and my little sister is exactly like me. Very caring, very compassionate, very quiet, which when I was younger I was very quiet, not like now, for those that know me. When Ashley was born, she was born with a seizure disorder. And the first time I ever held my little sister, she had a full-blown seizure in my arms. I thought I broke the baby, and so I freaked out a little bit. But Charlie was the person that took me aside and explained what a seizure disorder was. And when he realized I was really curious about it, he showed me to the most magical place I had ever seen. It was a library. And I got to go and get any book I wanted, and my passion became medicine. I liked medicine. I liked realizing what I didn't understand. And so that was purely because of Charlie. Charlie was the cool stepdad. I got to see Jurassic Park when I was six. My mom did not agree with him, but I sat there in utter fascination of what was happening. He was the one that when I got into the dinosaur phase before any boy in my class would hide fish bones in the sandbox in the backyard so I could pretend to be a paleontologist. When we moved to Massachusetts, in the <laughs> kind of angsty, inspiring father-daughter dances came up, when I realized I didn't have a father to take me because he was stationed at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, Charlie was the one that stepped up and took me. And so for that, I'm ever grateful. When I was about 10 years old, my mom was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. and it was kind of deemed by our family that my mom was not fit to take care of us. So Charlie's parents, my Nana and my Papa, were the ones that stepped up. Instead of having my sisters and I split up, and even though they've already raised four children of their own, they decided to take on three more. Maybe not the best situation, because <laughs> we were a handful. I, I can see that now, we were a handful but they did it. There was never a question if we were theirs, if they were ours, we made it all work. Their big thing was family traditions. So we used to go camping every summer. Uh, we used to go on mystery rides. I learned that the Boston Commons from an aerial view looks like an emerald necklace. So it's nicknamed the Emerald Necklace. A nice man by the Cheers bar told me that when I had to go figure it out on one of our scavenger hunts. And our papa was really into fun holidays, so we just had Groundhog's Day. In our family, Groundhog's Day is the Groundhog Fairy in her brown chiffon dress comes and brings us chocolate for breakfast. So when you're 12 years old and there is a chocolate cake sitting on your dining table for breakfast, 
you have the coolest pop in the world. There was always school and structure being key. Grades were really important. Our papa would always say, if we got A's, he would go dancing in the street in front of our house. I got A's. It never happened. <laughs> we were a very religious upbringing family. Every Sunday we were at church. Uh, choir practices, youth groups. And then it was always family dinners. We always ate together. But when I was a junior in high school, my papa got sick. He was diagnosed with brain cancer. And he slowly started to fade away. So the summer after I graduated, it became stressful at home to the point where tensions were so high. And when tensions are high, that one little straw breaks the camel's back. And I ended up getting kicked out. And I had to go live with my mom who had decided to marry a new person who wasn't my favorite person in the world. But at that time, I had also gotten accepted to the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I had gotten a scholarship. It was really exciting. I was excited. And everything fell apart because the structure was gone. My grandfather, Papa, ended up passing away. And my grandfather was also diagnosed with cancer at the same time. I was trying to do too much, and I just ended up having to leave Massachusetts. It wasn't until I moved to Colorado a few months later that I was actually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, PDD-NOS, and a generalized anxiety disorder. And that's where what I like to refer to as my mom's came in. My grandma, I call her Jima, and my auntie. I was back in California just having finished CIP. They were a constant sounding board for me. They helped me in trying to be more independent when understanding when to be present, when to step away. When my father died rather suddenly, they were there. They were there the entire time because by Michigan state law, my dad never remarried. Uh, it put everything on me because I was his eldest child. So the constant phone calls at 12 a.m. because I was freaking out about one little thing, my aunt would pick up the phone, no problem, talking me through the process. When I realized that this was the person that would be the grandfather to my children when I have them, how do I clean out a house knowing that? Knowing that I'm depriving my own children of knowing someone. And I sent, I think in the end it was 12 boxes of stuff from my dad's house. They were there to talk me through the process and figure everything out. When I graduated from college, and one of my grandmother's biggest quips is, I never do my hair, I never do my makeup. So I did it for her. Her first comment when she saw me was, it took 20 years for this to happen. Because the last time I had ever done my hair and makeup professionally was when I was a flower girl in my mom and Charlie's wedding. When I did well in a comp class, so they decided for my Christmas present to get me a keep calm and code on, because apparently I'm now an expert after an introductory class. <laughs> they were there, my village, through everything. But at the same time that my village raised me, I helped raise them. In the time of my grandparents and my parents, there was a stigma on mental health issues. My mother being bipolar, all the signs were there. And no one really paid attention to it. So my grandmother's vow was, because my sister and I are both on the spectrum, she would do everything she could to make up for what she couldn't do for my mom. When my dad found out we were on the autism spectrum, he refused to accept it. Coincidentally, after being diagnosed myself, after working at CIP for the last six years, the Aspie does not fall far from the tree. I'm pretty sure my dad is on the spectrum as well. But the really amazing thing was when I was cleaning out my dad's house, 
I had given him the book, Don't Look Me in the Eye. I would never thought he would actually read it. I was looking through his stuff. There were highlighter marks. There were sticky notes. There were parts where he had written my name next to something that totally explained something about me or something about my sister. And I know it took 27 years, but it was nice to see that some kind of understanding was being made. It was also really cool to see that my going to school, my suffering through school sometimes, had actually inspired my dad to try to go back to school. We found a whole bunch of local community college catalogs with some classes picked out for the fall of 2015. So what I've learned through all of this is to let go of any anger. You can't change what's already happened. It took me 26 years to figure this out. You're not the product of your upbringing. I explained some of my upbringing to you. I'm not a product of it. I get to be whoever I choose to be, not based on anything that anybody did for me. Wonder Woman syndrome does exist. I am a perfectionist. I have a problem with perfectionism. But I'm slowly learning that it's OK for things not to be perfect, though I try to keep it as perfect as possible. It's OK to be you. I have always been so afraid of how people perceive me and what people think of me that I would change myself based on who I was with at that time period. It's taken a long time, but now I know that when I'm giving a speech for work, it's OK to add some jokes in there, make fun of myself, make fun of my family, but it's me being me. But most importantly, we all teach each other. All of you that came here today are forming your own villages, forming what you need to make your own journeys to being you. And you're allowing us to be part of that. 